Okay, hi everyone. Today we have Varun Nair who's gonna speak about audio at Facebook. He's the head of uh, the audio department. Like, what is it like that? Yeah, oh, you can just read that yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Facebook. So, anyway, uh, thanks for being here. Sure. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Cool, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> So this conversation actually, like we, we were speaking at, we met at NAM and we were, I did a short talk about, a similar talk about audio at Facebook and <clears throat> I did a quick show of hands in the room about how many people actually associated uh, an audio team at Facebook and you know, there's lots of, I got lots of questioning looks about what does an audio team at Facebook even do if it's a social network, right? <clears throat> So hopefully at the end of this, a uh, lot of you will, will actually be a little more clear if you have those questions yourself. Um, so I'm part of the Facebook audio team. I've got some of my colleagues here uh, as well. Um, quickly give you an overview of the kind of things we do, the kind of work we do, and, uh, and also the challenges that are uh, very unique uh, to Facebook, uh, the kind of stuff that we, we deal with at the scale at which Facebook operates leads to lots of interesting challenges. Um, just give me one second. Let me just restart this. Okay, cool. Wait, so um, the audio team is quite wide. We do quite a few different things, uh, lots of interesting problems as well across the board. So we develop spatial audio tools and technologies for VR and AR, primarily with a focus on media within these mediums. How many of you have tried VR or VR headset? Cool. So uh, you know, initially the, the use case for VR and even now is, is, is about games and highly interactive experiences. And over the past few years, we've, we've seen media also starting to play a role in that. And we've seen um, 360 videos, cinematic experiences in VR, linear experiences, lots of people actually challenging what the medium is like. And that's where we come in out, and I'll talk about that in a bit. We also deal with audio encoding and delivery of audio across all the media surfaces at Facebook. Uh, so ensuring that the infrastructure exists, functions, scales well, um, and more importantly, also delivers audio at good quality. <clears throat> That's where the last point comes in, measuring and optimizing audio quality for video at the scale at which Facebook operates. More than two billion people using a range of devices and platforms and operating systems. Uh, all kinds of content hitting a platform, right from you know, very professionally produced content to stuff people have just recorded on a phone and uploading it. Um, so how do we ensure that we, how do we ensure that the people who use Facebook have a really good experience? And so we try to look at our work in multiple areas. So on the spatial audio side of things, we sort of under a brand called Audio360. It's part of the wider Facebook 360 effort, which I'll talk about in a bit. Under this, we develop audio tools. We've got Spatial Workstation, which is a suite of audio plugins uh, that helps people mix and design spatial audio for VR. So you can hook, plug a VR headset in, stay within the comfort of your DAW, like Pro Tools or Reaper, and mix directly <coughs> to the medium. We also support the infrastructure specifically for spatial audio to ingest, deliver, and stream down such experiences, and then also render it across all the Facebook apps, and as well as some of the immersive uh, VR apps as well, like Oculus Video. So it's, it's like a full breadth of trying to get creation, consumption, creation, sort of ingestion and consumption across the whole pipeline. And it's, it's quite a unique place to be where we we've, we've, you know, uh, can move the industry forward with tooling, but also ensure that we can move the industry forward with, with playback quality and streaming technology as well. So generally, we, we try to look at three different pillars of our work. One is supporting new ecosystems by uh, I'm sorry, it's a bit stretched, so it's all pixelated, but we support new ecosystems with the tools that we develop. We try and foster new communities to make, such use, of te make use of such technology and, and also explore all these new mediums. So we've got a, a group on Facebook where a lot of our users and our creators come together, and everybody on the team is on the group, and we try and do our best to help people not only understand technology, but also understand what the uh, potential impact for these technologies can be. So if, if you're a sound designer and all you've done is uh, Hollywood movies for the past 20 years of your life, how do you actually learn the tools and the techniques and the technology to actually go off and maybe translate all your creative skills into a completely new medium? 
And finally, how do we deliver high quality at the scale at which Facebook operates? Uh, both from a metrics perspective, being able to measure it, and also being able to actually technologically sort of deliver uh, such content at the scale at which Facebook operates. And so what drives us is we're always driving towards having a consistent audio ecosystem across our tools, across our playback technology, and across all, the, all, of, all products that Facebook supports, as well as outside Facebook as well. We give away a lot of our technology and our SDKs for free for anyone to use. So it's about ensuring that we, we do our best to reduce the amount of friction in actually making such content at the scale at which we operate. So if I had to zoom out a bit, um, I think the past four years has been really interesting for media at large across the industry. Uh, we moved from you know just videos being on the internet and uh, then we moved to higher quality videos and HD videos and then 4K videos and and we've seen lots of uh, TV shows coming on you know, started being released only on, on the internet and the Netflix and all of that. Um, but we, we are also seeing a, a sort of parallel track of, of immersion. Uh, where we move from just watching a video on your phone or on your desktop to actually getting some sense of an immersive experience on a 2D screen, and then all the way down to VR headsets or um, on your phone. So we've also started to see lots of simple AR experiences as well. So Facebook has camera effects where you can use the camera app or the camera uh, tool in Facebook to, to you know, draw little masks on your face that is automatically tracked. So simple effects that actually bring this concept of immersion to everybody across the world. Um, so our work is basically trying to track these two different things. How do, we, uh, how do we track immersive media? How do we track non-immersive media? And how do we support it within Facebook, but across the industry at large? And how can we push the whole industry forward so our team's success is very much looked on not just at not just by the success of facebook but the success of the audio industry at large uh, so a quick show of hands how many of you know about spatial audio or work with spatial audio technologies okay cool so i'll just skim over some of the details for the rest of you so we are all on the same page uh, <clears throat> And more specifically, I'll talk about what, it, what we do that is specific to Facebook. So uh, a few years ago, one of the things that came about is uh, trying to create 360 degree video experiences on Facebook, where you could upload a three, 360 video or a photograph, uh, and then you could use your phone, which basically is a window into this world to look around the video and the scene. Um, you could do that on a browser as well, on a desktop. Use your mouse or a keyboard to look around uh, a 360 scene, all within the Facebook news feed. So as you actually scroll and look for content, you see it, and you can jump into this little immersive world and get out of it. And then also bringing that to VR headsets, like the Gear VR, which is a mobile VR headset. So you can actually put it on and be a part of that experience, um, which was an interesting use case to solve. Because on one hand, for people who hadn't gone into VR, it was, it was almost introducing to them what immersive content could be like. And we're talking about people across the world, right? So um, it's, not just very sp it's not just specific to uh, a few markets or, or a few uh, geographies around the world. It's everybody. Um, and then for people who actually are experiencing VR to then be able to scale that into a, a VR experience. And so where does, yeah, go ahead. So we've seen 360 video or images on, on, your, on your Facebook page. Do you expect audio to do the right thing? Yes, definitely. Uh, and that's where we come in. So uh, we support Amazonics. Um, so you can use our tools or any other tools to, to create an Amazonic mix or um, even just use an Amazonic microphone. Some of the cameras, 360 cameras, have my Amazonic microphones with them. So you can upload to Facebook. And um, that's where we come in. We render the mix binaurally on desktops and mobile devices and VR as well uh, across the board. Um, and so the same rendering technology is used across all the apps and our tools as well, and our SDKs that we give out, so it's, which is really important for people making content because you want your mix to sound the same. It, so it's, a re, it's a terrible experience for you as a creator when you finish your work, upload it to the platform, and it sounds like something else altogether. And that's really important for spatial audio, as some of you might know. The actual rendering technology matters a lot. How you actually convert an ambisonic field into a, a binaural mix makes a huge difference. 
So uh, just also want to clarify where we are in time. Um, generally, see a lot of words being used, 3D audio, surround sound, spatial audio, object-based audio, ambisonics. Uh, most of you might be familiar <coughs> with this already. Uh, we tend to just use spatial audio because it, it, it nicely encapsulates everything that we do. Um, today, for 360 videos or cinematic linear VR experiences, we primarily use ambisonics because it's, uh, it's a really nice and easy and nifty format to deploy at scale. But we are, we are looking into what object-based audio could, could be like for such mediums and how we could deliver that at scale as well. The key point here, standards are evolving. Uh, we're nowhere at the point where everybody in the world has a VR headset. Uh, it, we haven't reached that stage yet. And, and it's, it's similar for content as well. There is no rule book. We don't have like the past 50 years as we do for film where we can actually look back and learn all the techniques and the technologies that have worked and have not worked. We are very much at uh, stage one where we're trying to figure all of this out, not just us on, from a technological standpoint, but uh, I'd say more so from a creative standpoint. Because if you look at this, look at spatial audio as a whole, it's been around for so long. Ambisonics has been around in the 70s. Uh, the techniques to actually convert an ambisonic field into binaural audio as well, and rendering binaural audio, all of that has exist, existed for so long. But it's a link between studios making content to leveraging such technologies and then playing it back on, on platforms like Facebook and YouTube or any of the VR headsets. That, that's where it makes a huge difference because now you've got this whole pipeline with sort of all the links connected uh, and making sense. And through this process, we also learned that uh, and it's not just about the technology. Quite often, uh, the first thing that comes to people's mind is, oh, it's VR, everything needs to be spatial. Not really, uh, maybe not. Uh, as a creator, you might want to have the creative license to have things to be spatialized or not. So uh, at Facebook, we actually support multiple stems in the sense that you can, uh, you, in addition to like an ambisonic mix, you can, um, <clears throat> also have a, just a two-channel stereo mix uh, along with what you upload. So you can have some things that are spatialized and others that aren't. So a common example is things like voiceovers, which you wouldn't want rotating around. Maybe you do, but most cases you don't, uh, because it, it feels odd to hear a voice that isn't anchored to anything in space um, visually. So we see it more as a creative medium. So we also see lots of people using like the headlocked audio stem or, or the non-spatialized audio stem for interesting things like dealing with low frequency content. Uh, low frequencies generally don't work well with binaural renderers because that's, that's the way we perceive audio. So all, they almost treat the headlock stem as, a, as an LFE channel. So they can just send a lot of low frequencies to it that gets directly routed to the ears. So the key point here and a big learning for us is uh, we need to leverage the technology that exists, do things with it that makes sense for the platform, but more importantly, ensure that you sort of leave enough doors open for creative people to just make use of it. And we are often surprised by the things that happen. So what makes audio spatial? Uh, I'll just skim over this briefly. Um, you know, the many effects that come into play when we actually perceive sp audio spatially, as most of you might know, most of it is related to um, the physical shape of our heads and our ears and, uh, and also the, uh, uh, the psychoacoustic aspects of all of this. <clears throat> um, so when we actually play back spatial audio, render spatial audio across in any of the Facebook apps or anybody else who uses our SDKs, we've got a binaural renderer that takes these effects into consideration uh, to ensure that you have a really good sense of space. So if you hear a sound above you, you feel like it's above you over a normal pair of headphones, you don't need uh, additional hardware. And that's, that, that's another thing that we care a lot about. We should be able to play back these experiences almost anywhere. We've got people using all kinds of Android devices and iOS devices and desktops with different browsers. We try our best to ensure that we can hit most people uh, by ensuring that the stuff we build is performant and works well. Um, Sorry. Yeah, so I just want to, uh, hold on. Oops. Come on. 
Yeah, so one of the things I just mentioned was this concept of headlocked um, audio and spatialized audio. So spatialized audio is something that's out there in the space, locked to the world. So as you look around the space, um, it feels like it, it continues to belong at that point. So if I've got a sound off towards my left and I turn around, if I turn around towards it, it I feel like it's in front of me. If I face this way, I feel like it's behind me. Whereas headlocked audio um, we, is audio that doesn't rotate as you look around. So um, if it's off towards your left and you turn around, it's still towards your left, just like how stereo audio has worked. Um, and if you look at it just technologically, it's, it's, it's a really simple thing to do. Uh, but the, sort of the creative outcomes of it um, are, are sort of much more higher than the sort of technical investment you can make um, in this medium. So when you upload content to Facebook today, we support uh, uh, audio that's got ambisonics. We support first and second order today. Uh, might be supporting other orders in the future. And you can also add in the headlocked audio stem to ensure that that gets routed as well. Um, and we provide all the tools to help you do that so you don't have to worry about things like metadata and codecs and formats and stuff. So for those of you who haven't seen a 360 degree video, here's a quick example. Uh, this was uh, uh, one by National Geographic and uh, Felix and Paul Studios. Uh, it was uh, uh, Obama's visit to the Yosemite National Park. Um, so you obviously won't get a spatial experience over speakers in the room, uh, but it'll still give you a sense of being able to look around the space and you'll see a helicopter off in the distance and if you had headphones on and as you, as you rotated around, you'd hear the helicopter sort of continuing to be at that, in that, at that point in space. Um, and this works on browsers as well as uh, any of mobile devices. So for, for this audio mix, you would have the narrator, which is Obama with the headlocked audio track, so he doesn't rotate around as you look around the scene. But everything else that is in the world, like the helicopter and some of the ambient sounds, does rotate. Um, can be a very good effect, both on if you have a VR headset on or not. So th this is really important for us because it, it introduces a lot of people to this medium. Um, so when they actually think about VR, there's some association with this brief or small sense of immersion that they've got on a, on a 2D screen. OK. So uh, where does our team come in and what do we do? So I'll talk about sp our spatial audio efforts first. Um, in a little more detail uh, and sort of give you a good sampling of the kind of problems that we try to solve. Um, I also want to mention that we've got other audio teams at Facebook as well. There's uh, an audio team at Oculus that develops the Oculus Audio SDK. They, they primarily focus on games or interactive kind of experiences. We've got another team in Redmond, Oculus Research. They, they deal with more sort of the hardcore research problems for long-term efforts. Our team is, is so, somewhat in between. We, do research a bit, but we also uh, focus on building products and experiences uh, and supporting uh, a large creative community to, to make such content. So uh, we, our spatial audio efforts can be roughly segregated into two things. We've got Spatial Workstation, which is a suite of tools for creating spatial audio. And we've got our Audio 360 SDK, which is a cross-platform C++ and JavaScript SDK to render spatial audio, uh, whether it's ambisonics or object-based stuff, across, um, across all the platforms we support, so web, iOS, Android, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, it's, uh, both of these things are, are free, free to download, free to use. Um, they've been free for many years, and Spatial Workstation is one of the most widely used tools for creating uh, spatial audio for linear experiences. So I'll talk briefly about the tools. Um, so here's a quick screenshot uh, of it. Um, we've, we've got tools that can help you position sounds in space. 
Uh, we also ship various other components with it to help, help you sort of prepare content for uploading or playing back in your own apps. Uh, and we also ship various video-related components to make it much easier to use VR headsets with a DAW. So our team uh, does everything for the server-side encoding pipeline. Uh, the delivery rules to play back such content, it can be quite complicated to ensure that we're getting the, the right stream and the right quality down to the right devices at the right point in time. Um, and we've got the SDK. Uh, same SDK is used across all the Facebook apps, and we ship the same version publicly as well. So if you were to use the SDK in your own apps, you'd get the very same code uh, or the very same compile code that runs in the Facebook apps. The goal here is to allow people to be able to mix once but deliver everywhere. To uh, as as a creator, it 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 puts a lot of pressure on you to mix. Uh, a piece of content, but to mix it in different formats just so you can publish to multiple platforms and to reach as many people as you can. Uh, we want to avoid that because we want to reduce the amount of friction, uh, just to reduce the amount of friction. Um, so our goal here is to allow people to be able to mix once so they can mix using our tools, but then use our tools to publish to Facebook, to publish to YouTube, to build their own apps, uh, or to use one of the many other platforms out there for VR. And we don't restrict people to do that. Use our tools, use it for whatever you need to, need to use it for. So we've seen people use it for VR and 360, or even prototyping games, or building simple AR experiences. Uh, so use it for all kinds of stuff. And we want to aid this, this, this thing where we want to close the loop on distribution, cut down the number of steps it takes to actually get content published from the time you think of making it. Uh, and that is a loop we're const constantly trying to optimize from our side and, and to just make it easier. I mentioned a Facebook group earlier. Uh, you can uh, head there if you're interested. It's a really good group of, of creators, and it's a re really strong community that's built, of, built around people trying to make content. And uh, it's a group managed by everybody on the team. And we uh, do, our, do our best to support, support everybody. Uh, to help have discussions about technology. But it's also great for us because we learn so much from everybody making content. And uh, we get feature requests, bug reports, uh, everything, uh, which, which makes it a really uh, great experience for all of us. So um, going back to Spatial Workstation, uh, we released Spatial Workstation in 2000. 15? No. We had the first question out in 2014. 2014. So it's been been around for a while, uh, come to think of it. Uh, uh, but our goal has always been about, OK, you've got game audio tools. You, you can use game audio middleware. You can use game engines to do whatever you want. And that's always a possibility. But if you are creating a linear VR experiences, a linear VR experience, and say so you're working in a studio, and all you've done all your life is just working in post-production, it's quite a leap to go from working with DAWs to a game engine and middleware. So you're trying to come up with something that sort of sits in between both of these workflows. How, how could we get uh, the immersive sort of VR experience into a linear timeline? And then how could we ensure that we propagate this across the industry? So if we could get people continuing to use such tools, which can be really powerful. If you're working from an, a purely interactive game-like experience, it can be limiting. But if you're working on a film or any sort of linear experience, this is usually what you need. You need a good DAW, good editing, good mixing, good processing. And you need to have a good workflow to get your mix out and then publish. Um, so if we could bridge this gap, we'd, we'd set up the industry to to just be able to make better content. And if they can make better content, it would make uh, putting a VR headset on all the more interesting. So our philosophy here is, is basically we, we try to, I, I mentioned this loop that we're trying to constantly trying to optimize, and we do this with workflow as well. Spatial Workstation can, allows you to take in a range of uh, different, kind, different kinds of input content. It could be ambisonics, it could be mono, stereo, multi-channel. You can then re-spatialize it, position those sounds in space to your video or not. Um, preview it within the comfort of your DAW with a VR headset or not. Um, and then publish. So we, 
we want to cut down the number of steps it takes to, to, to preview content because um, making any sort of content is uh, an iterative process. You need to try things out. You figure that half your ideas don't work. Most of your ideas don't work. You go back to the drawing board and you try and figure it out again. Um, and we want to make that process as easy as possible. If you had to, say, make a piece of content, uh, make an app out of it, to then preview it in VR, and then publish to Facebook or YouTube to figure out what it's going to sound like. That's a lot of steps, and that's a lot of time. Time equals money. Um, money equals budgets. Budgets equal the amount of content being made. So if you can cut that down, we're just making people's jobs easier. So one of the first things that you'd use in Spatial Workstation um, is, is the Spatializer plugin. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, rendering is a bit bad. It shouldn't look that pixelated. Uh, well, the frame rate, the frame rate's bad as well. Um, but anyway, uh, you can think of it as a uh, as a as a more advanced banner than what you would use in your DAW. Uh, these are uh, parameters to position the sound in 3D space. We also try to bring a lot of game audio or uh, stuff that people who've been working with spatial audio have seen all their lives. If you use Max MSP, you've probably seen this kind of stuff like you know, distance attenuation, Doppler effects, uh, room modeling, all of that stuff to just bring it into uh, a format that most people use working with post-production could use. Uh, the 360 video uh, is also shown here, except it's, uh, it's flattened and rolled out into an equirectangular format. So what you can do is you can just follow characters with your mouse and directly write automation. So it's a really fast way to write 3D automation without having to second guess what the scene is going to look like or sound like or uh, use any other sort of uh, uh, method. Um, it's a really fast way to, to write your spatialization parameters. So something to bear in mind is that a lot of this content doesn't, so in this case, this is animated, so you might be able to get some data from a game engine to drive it. But in a lot of cases, people shoot live action content with the camera, and they don't have data about where actors are positioned in space. They <coughs> have to create it from scratch. So if, you, if they're working in film and, fix, and mixing for 5.1, they do something similar, but the level of accuracy you need for VR is much greater. If you are off by a few degrees, if you're in a large cinema hall, probably doesn't matter. As soon as you put a VR headset on and look around, you'll actually feel that object drifting or, or feeling like it's dis 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 uh, disconnected uh, from um, the visual reference. And uh, here's a list of all the input formats we support. So it's uh, mono, multi-channel, uh, ambisonics, first and second order, uh, surround sound formats as well, so you can virtualize positions. Um, that's more for cases where people, we saw a lot of people, uh, a lot of the initial VR content was sort of secondary marketing stuff for film. Um, so you had this cool movie coming out and they'd create a short VR experience and that often use the same assets that they uh, use while uh, mixing the film. So we just created a bunch of presets to help them reuse a lot of those stems and content. Uh, recently we extended this because uh, it's quite obvious that following a camera with a mouse is a tedious process and uh, takes time. So uh, we added an object tracker. Um, so you can just select, select the object uh, and then hit play. It'll track the object and write automation simultaneously. Uh, so uh, which you know, for most of us who've, who work with technology, uh, we, we see, these, you see these kind of examples often, but if you're working in post-production, this is like magic. Uh, it's, it's, it's stuff you don't see often. So we enjoy trying to bridge, uh, bridge all these different technologies together to just make it easy for people to make content. And this saves people time. And because it saves people time, they can actually spend all the extra time that they've gained on making the mix sound better, uh, spending more time on the narrative and the story and the design, which ends up giving them more time to make better content uh, and reduce the amount of money that they spend. So it, it's all good stuff. Uh, the, the second plugin that you'd often use, this is on a master track. It's basically uh, where the binaural renderer is. So each of the spatializer plugins output ambisonics. They go to master track. 
uh, or an aux or a bus, and um, this, that's where this plugin sits, and it's got the same renderer that's used across all the Facebook apps, so you hear the same experience uh, while you're mixing. So while you're mixing, you know that it's roughly what it's going to sound like when you publish to each of these platforms. And this is where the fun stuff comes in. We also have a 360 video player that we ship because one of the interesting things with working in a new medium is that the ecosystem takes a long time to catch up. Uh, things need to be standardized, formats need to uh, work everywhere, people need to agree on how to do things. So and your average DAW would not have a 360 uh, video player overnight. So we shipped one. Uh, that's um, automatically slave to your project. So you hit play in your project and it follows. You move, around, move your timeline around, it keeps sync uh, with, with sort of good frame accuracy. Um, so as you look around the scene, this information is sent back to the plugins. Um, you can't see much, but it moves things. Um, and um, you can also hear your sound rotating, your sound field rotating. So you basically end up recreating the experience of what the end user is going to see if to get onto any of these platforms. You can also plug in a VR headset and have the video directly projected on in the headset and the head tracking sent back to the plugin. So again, you've got so one shot feedback on uh, what it's going to sound and look like without having to export this out into an app or publish to Facebook or YouTube or any of the other platforms out there. So is, the, is that piping, I don't know, right now it seems like it's Reaper down there. Mm -hmm. And earlier you were showing Pro Tools, so is, is there some kind of VST plugin back to the, so you can, basically, how does the audio come back to the DAW if that's what you're listening through? Because that seems like the impression. That so I'm the thinking. audio always stays in the DAW. Okay. okay. So all of these plugins are VSTs or AX, so they are hosted in the DAW, they process everything in the DAW. Uh, in your DAW, you set your output device as your VR headset. Uh, I'll talk about this in a bit, but the player receives the head, head tracking information and sends that over to the plugins via OSC. Um, and that then renders the express based on where you're looking. So that way you can also do all your mastering in your DAW and get all your plugins in there without having to get out of um, a tool you're used to using. Um, and you can finish, do your edits and everything in one place without having to export to another application and come back in. Once you're done with your mix, we also provide a tool called the encoder. Uh, I often mention at talks that we're very creative with our names, which is why it's called the encoder. Uh, um, where you just drop in your video assets, your audio assets, choose your output format, which could be YouTube, Facebook, um, and we've got a bunch of other audio formats in there, um, and it converts it to the right codec, injects the right metadata, and you've got the right file to upload to Facebook. So, Again, uh, an average uh, sound designer working or a mixer working in a film studio doesn't want to use a command line, doesn't want to open up terminal, doesn't want to type, type out stuff and make mistakes there. So it's just a really easy way to get this done. Um, it also helps us. It's, it's an easy way for us to introduce new formats, introduce new ways to get this data out because uh, um, it's just a simple GUI application that they can use to get their job done. So how does this um, all come together? So I'll just give you a quick uh, schematic view, although you might just see pixels, but uh, I'll do my best. I can promise all of this exists in an HD version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny, it's even pixelated on my screen. Oh, anyway. <laughs> OK. So. This box here is your local computer, and then you've got this box here, which is your DAW. We currently support Reaper and Pro Tools. We have supported Nuendo in the past. We will be supporting it again once they finish adding Ambisonic support. Um, and you might have multiple spatializer plugins in your scene, so each track would typically have a spatializer plugin to help you position the sound in space. Um, all of that gets sent to, you, to the control plugin, so you can actually audition your binaural mix in real time. Then got the video player, where you can load your 360 degree video, look around the scene, it, it stays in sync with your door. Uh, 
backend, we run this thing called media server. As a user, you never see it, but it basically, it's tasked with decoding video as fast as it can, keeping it in sync with time code, uh, and all that fun stuff. Uh, behind the scenes, we use OpenGL for all the video rendering. Uh, the plugin sends time code to the video player via OSC. We use OSC because it's simple, and we uh, hope to uh, open up the spec zone. So if you want to, you know, move components around or use your own component elsewhere, you'd be free to do so. Uh, the video player sends camera orientation back via OSC to the control plugin, so it can render your binaural mix based on where you're looking. You can also connect a VR headset, uh, which sends the head tracking information down to the video player, which then passes that on to the control plugin. Video player uh, displays the video frame in the headset. You could also have a remote computer, because again, we found that lots of audio people like working on Macs, uh, but most of the VR headsets work on Windows. So uh, you could run the video player on a Windows machine or just another machine if you choose to. And as long as it's on the same uh, network, um, it can discover the control plugin, and they can start speaking to each other, and again, share time code and camera orientation via OSC, um, and it all just works really well. So yep. your concept of uh, VR or augmented reality is only in terms of 360 terms, not in terms of moving in free space. Um, so I'd say our initial, from a media perspective, our initial stab is just uh, rotation and not translation. We've started doing some work with translation as well by tr trying to use the same linear mix that you create but giving a sense of movement within it. So for example, um, if you see any of the content from Lytro, which is a company that does light field video, they use our stuff under the hood. So the same mixes that you create, we can still render sort of a battle axe effect with, with limited sense of motion. Um, that's primarily limited by ambisonics, uh, obviously. Uh, I think the future is where once we eventually get to something that could be object-based or a mixed experience, it would help you translate or move into those experiences easily. Um, today, if you wanted to make a fully interactive experience, like a game-like experience, you probably wouldn't be using this workflow all the time. You'd use this workflow to make your initial content, but then use a game engine to actually position it in space. Whereas in the specific case that our team looks at, we are trying to we are trying to envision what media could be in VR. Today, it is it takes the form of 360 content, but it could be something else in the future, and we're just driving that line further forward. Because uh, a lot of there's lots of work being done on the game side of thing because that's the obvious use case. But uh, like if you look at any of the statistics out there. Um, lots of people enjoy watching video in VR um, because it's, it's less friction. They, if you're not a gamer, you can still use a VR headset. So we're just trying to constantly question and answer, really answer the question of what, what the future of media is going to be in these immersive platforms. And so this is step zero in that, in that long future. So what sort of technologies do we use? So, uh, we've got a spatial audio library, so this is where all the audio fun stuff happens. Uh, our actual plugins are built with Juice, but that's like a really thin layer that just binds everything together. But our spatial audio library is, is just C++, SIMD optimized, all that good stuff. Uh, we do everything from object-based to ambisonics to all your reflection modeling, some propagation, all of that cool stuff. So we've actually only exposed a few components of that in spatial workstation, but um, can do a lot more. And that's where we see the evolution of the medium um, moving forward as well. Then there's all the video and graphics work, as I mentioned, specifically for our tools. Like all the audio stuff is related to the tools, but also for our SDK that's used across all the Facebook apps. Lots of video and graphics work on the um, on the tooling side, being able to render the video and uh, VR headset integration and all of that stuff. And then all the networking as well, uh, discovery of clients, OSC, and uh, remote video synchronization and ensuring that everything works well together. Computer vision stuff as well for object tracking. Um, so um, 
It's, it's a good stack of problems. So as, as a team, we do everything from uh, JavaScript stuff to, and web audio to ensure that we can actually render the same spatial audio experience on, on web browsers uh, to lots of low-level C++ stuff uh, and DSP work to, uh, for ambisonics and um, spatial audio rendering um, to sort of higher-level architectural stuff for having a really fast audio engine that can service all the Facebook apps, the Oculus apps, as well as any other apps that people want to build and use in the ecosystem, and then all the other stuff for, uh, for the tools that we develop. So lots of fun problems there to solve. So I just want to give a quick overview of the general signal flow when you're making content. So you typically have multiple spatializer plugins. They upload ambisonics. They go to the control plugin. Monitor your mix binaurally. Then you could have stereo panels, as you would in, an, in a normal stereo session. And that could form the headlocked audio stem that I mentioned previously. And then you'd export out the ambisonic mix. You'd export out the headlocked stereo channel. So for second order ambisonics, you'd have nine channels of audio. You'd have these two channels. So in total, your mix is about 11 channels of audio. You can then use the um, encoder wrap with the video and get your assets ready for Facebook or YouTube or your custom VR apps, whether you're using our SDK or your own technology, that's totally up to you. But what happens once this actually hits Facebook? Oops, yeah. So uh, you've got your audio stems, you can get it at the encoder app, you get a final video which you upload to Facebook. That kicks off the whole ingestion and transcoding pipeline uh, lots of interesting stuff that happens there to ensure that we are uh, uh, not just for audio but for video as well to ensure that we are encoding into all the right formats and qualities and all the different codecs and uh, resolutions that all the different mobile and VR devices support. Um, and then we've got all the infrastructure to, to choose the right encoding and the right format to stream that down to all our clients, which could be the Facebook Android app, the iOS app, uh, Facebook on the web, uh, Oculus Video on Android, and that's backed by our C++ audio SDK. And on the web, we actually uh, transpile a lot of our C++ code in, with mscript in into uh, uh, ASM.js or WebASM, um, and combine that with web audio, and um, that's what powers the web experience. So we actually use the same filters and same logic in, um, in sort of the native land as well as JavaScript. So we can ensure that we've got a consistent experience. And it's great for engineering and for everyday engineering as well, because we don't have to maintain two major code bases. We just maintain one code base, target all platforms with it. So you talk about the actual audio SDK, if it's free to download and use. So uh, it's, it's got a basic C++ API where you can play back ambisonic files or play back any of the formats that we support. Uh, you can also play back objects, so mono audio and position that in space and uh, distance attenuation and reflection. So it's like a mini game engine um, inside that can do a whole bunch of stuff. As I mentioned, it's a cross-platform C++ library. It can decode and mix ambisonic and headlock audio streams. It can play back mono streams and spatialize them. Uh, it supports listener orientation and translation. Uh, and also sort of sixed off or parallax and translation with ambisonic um, linear mixes as well, which is really interesting. Um, and we've got uh, all sorts of wrappers for Java, uh, for um, JavaScript, and game engine integrations as well. So you can drag and drop this into Unity and get, get it working out of the box quite easily. It's really performant. Um, so if the blue box is, if that was the amount of CPU that all the video stuff takes, that's how much we take, uh, which, makes, uh, which makes people very happy because you don't, have to, you don't have to get into this battle of fighting for CPU resources or anything, any of that. We just get in uh, and get the job done. Um, when you're working on Facebook scale, this becomes really important because you can't just drop a one MB library into the Facebook app and hope that everything works out okay. Uh, it, it affects uh, the size of the app. <coughs> People hate downloading large apps, right? So uh, I think we initially spent way more time optimizing for binary size than we did for CPU, um, because 
that is a much harder job compared to, uh, compared to just performance optimizations. And that's always a constant battle. Uh, the kind of, so we minimize the use of external libraries. Our audio SDK almost uses no external libraries at all. Everything's handwritten from scratch to ensure that we can optimize for this as well as performance across all the apps we support. And outside of all the VR and spatial audio stuff, we care a lot about audio quality. So we've got efforts to measure the perceptual audio quality um, and building up metrics to uh, understand w what that means at Facebook scale and how we can optimize uh, everything we do for audio across all these devices and platforms. So, um, so lots of daily challenges on, you know, on general audio stuff, DSP and all of, all of the fun stuff there, uh, to workflow and tooling and actually understanding how we can expose this technology to all these creators out there, all, all the studios, all the people making content. And lastly, how do we actually then take, take all of that and scale it at the scale and size at which Facebook operates, which by itself can be a huge learning experience as anyone on the team can, can uh, agree with me on that. <coughs> So um, yeah, so uh, it's a really interesting time as well because Facebook is, is, is a social platform, uh, but it's also become a place for uh, people to watch videos, to share experiences, to share content, but also uh, Facebook's investing heavily into immersive media and VR and AR, and so uh, our team's at an interesting place because we are, we are almost at, we are at the point where both of these worlds are colliding. We, we service content that's on Facebook, but we also service all these headsets, and that comes with its own interesting challenges to solve, because uh, if you had to just solve for a VR headset, we could maybe assume, hey, you've got this super computer or this cool gaming PC, it's got all the CPU and memory you need, but on the other hand, we need to serve the same content at the same quality for your average Android phone um, that probably has horrible audio latency, it doesn't have the same CPU specs or the memory requirements. And then finally, how do you ship it in an app where size matters? Cool, so if you want to find out more, uh, you can hit that link. Uh, that's where our SDK and the tools are. That's the audio group that I mentioned. Um, cool, that brings me exactly to 45 minutes, so happy to take any questions. Got others here as well who'd be happy to talk about stuff. Sure. Um, you were mentioning scale a lot, and, was, and, and audio quality. I was wondering uh, if there's any kind of, I mean, perceptual compression for the, for you know for ambisonics or for any of the spatial audio. And obviously, going from two from a stereo channel to eleven. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. Uh, there is interesting work happening. Um, so some of the folks at Google are, as well at, in the Chrome Media team uh, were doing some work with the Opus Codec to. Uh, to improve it for ambisonics. It's, uh, it's an active area that we are looking at as well. There's, we haven't sort of come up with the perfect solution yet. Uh, but you know, we already see the side effects of a lot of these codecs that were built for channel-based formats. As soon as you apply them for ambisonics, they, and they disregard phase and everything else, and you end up with weird artifacts, which are not, not ideal. So we've got a long way to go. Um, it's just exposed to the to people mixing. So currently, it's a simple shoebox model. So you can just specify the size of of the room. So it's just something that creators. Yeah, control. correct. Uh, because uh, we haven't reached a stage where you know a, a film creator is at set and actually has a, a geometric capture. We're starting to see that, but we haven't reached that at scale yet. So for now, we just let the sound designer choose whatever they think sounds best. So lots of people use uh, convolution reverbs or even surround reverbs that they then virtualize with ambisonics and binaudalize. So it's basically a mix of tools. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you've seen some people using these more static or linear creation tools as a first step toward uh, a more dynamic or interactive uh, project. Could you talk more about what that has looked like? Sure. So, a few examples I can think of are uh, seen some people using ambisonics to create ambient beds. 
So you're in a forest scene, um, the sound of crickets and birds and stuff uh, doesn't have to, uh, you don't need sort of the translational effects for it, they're just a bed. So you can just mix it, mix an ambisonic bed, it saves you a lot of time in actually spatializing individual sound sources. You can treat it like a linear mix and use the tools that you've got, export out an ambisonic mix and you get a really good effect in VR. Uh, a case that I found really interesting was music. Uh, because there's, there's been, been a lot of, uh, there are lots of strong opinions on how music should be mixed generally, but there are even stronger opinions on how music should be mixed with spatial audio. Um, so uh, lots of people who have got very strong opinions that you shouldn't spatialize music, it should just be um, a static mix, it shouldn't, unless it's diegetic and in the scene, it should not be spatial. Whereas, uh, but I've, I was of the same opinion until I heard some really good content where they just mix it in first order ambisonics, which by itself is so diffuse uh, that you don't get, get the sort of pointed nature of object-based audio uh, that it just sounded okay. You, know, you had your strings that were all a bit uh, spread around and so sort of smudgy and um, it, it worked. So um, that, that's, that's another example. Um, third is also people just prototyping. So uh, they end up, uh, getting quick gameplay videos from the game and they just use the tools to make prototypes with what the sound design could be like and then they use that as a reference when they actually implement stuff in something like WISE or FMOD or Unity. So for the 360 video on Facebook, uh, do you have an idea of uh, how many people are actually using the the, the, the ambisonics or binaural rendering, you know, in a like what, what kind of feedback do you get from users? Like uh, does like Lambda users actually notice something, you know, or, mm. or something like that? So. Yeah, so I can't speak on specific numbers, but uh, we've seen some interesting things where, you know, like uh, we've had publishers put out an experience and they actually mentioned Put your headphones on, uh, which was cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are things that we do as well. If we detect spatial audio, we have a little pop-up that tells people that they'd have a better experience if they plug headphones in. Uh, and we had seen some very positive results in doing that because uh, we again don't see our role as just saying, hey, here's some technology, but also educating people into what the yeah, positive yeah. stuff could be from it. Um, so doing simple things like that, and we work closely with the design teams at Facebook to figure out what that could mean, what are the right words we should use, do people understand it? Uh, and I don't think we've learned everything there. We're still learning, uh, but we've definitely seen really strong positive impact in just people being told that they could have a better experience from it. Yeah, it's interesting, because right? you guys are kind of on the wrong line to promote this type of yep. technology, right? So, uh, so yes. <coughs> Go ahead. So just to add on, I think uh, with VR in general, uh, there's at least a subsection or a niche, a niche section of society which expects certain features to be part of a VR experience. And at least over the years, the general feeling is spatial audio is becoming the norm. Whereas, unlike you know, uh, for game audio and so on, the uh, sound designers would have to go and tell of the uh, producers that, hey, we really need good audio, is the other way around when producers who are producing content. They want to say that, hey, we need spatial audio, what do we need to do to get it in? Mm. So, which is a good change overall. So, we are doing our bit as well to make people aware, but at the same yeah. time, people understand that for VR, you can't get away by repurposing content. You have to make it for VR, for make it for 360. Yeah, one, one of the things that I found that was really interesting, and I constantly like, was telling everyone we should capitalize on this, was when, like, when Facebook acquired Oculus and this whole VR thing like, just blew up and, and uh, became a thing. There's lots of press about the importance of audio, and so all of all of these people get into VR were just for reading everywhere that spatial audio is important. Spatial audio is important, and I was just telling everyone that we have to capitalize on this. Never in the history of media has audio been told has audio people been told that what they're doing is so important. Right? So uh, it's an opportunity, and we need to run with it. <laughs> If I, may, I think it's really interesting that um, spatial audio is, a, is um, for people who don't have a VR headset, is one of the more accessible ways that it can experience an immersion. Because if you need headphones, pretty much everyone has headphones, right? If you put the headphones on, um, even if it's not dynamic, even if it's just a binaural rendering or something that you may have created here, not everyone can go to the Paramount concert and see it without 64 speakers. They can experience something like that in a video. And, and then when you add kind of the ability to kind of rotate in my swivel in my chair, um, 
you can really can get some interesting effects, and it's a lot more accessible than a VR headset, which costs a lot of money and a lot of people don't have. So that, that being said, we can uh, totally get a live stream of the 64 channel thing, boil it down the first order and we saw this live stream on Facebook. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's another interesting thing as well. You know, we added support for uh, so Facebook's got a live video product, which most of you know, where you can go live directly on your phone, stream video. Um, 360 video support was also added, and we then added spatial audio support, so you can stream a first order mix uh, live, which opens up all these interesting cases. And if you do want to stream uh, your next concert, uh, nothing stopping you. Uh, um, and uh, L lots of opportunities for for even people outside outside of uh, what I'd call sort of the wider public. Um, if even even you know people who just care about audio doing cool stuff, it's just an opportunity to, to be creative. Um, which is where the spatial workstation group is great because you just get people doing stuff. Some of the, some of it is like totally unexpected, and you end up seeing really cool music videos and spatial audio that. Are just fun to watch. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you very much. Oh, happy to.